Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome to the Hoopsters League of Action Heroes. We have been conducting several seminars and several webinars over the last few months talking about taboo subjects, which are often overlooked and which actually need tons of awareness. And one such subject is epilepsy. Today we have with us Maestro K.C. Janardhan, who is a calligraphy maestro and is also the professor of penmanship and management. Sir, so thank you so much for being with us today. And your journey is extremely interesting for me to talk about. And I'm so glad that you agreed to join us today. Thank you, Nupur. I'm equally excited to share. All right. So before we begin, uh, my first question to you is, why did you agree to come and do this talk? Why do you think a talk like this is important? You see, the talk like this is very important because the social stigma that is surrounding these kind of issues is very strong even today. And people don't want to come out in the open and admit it or talk about it. And they suffer in silence. Right. In fact, uh, a lot of people uh, feel very embarrassed to talk about such kind of issues. I think the time has come for us to really open up and then tell it to the public and also save a lot of people from agony and distress and depressions that they go into. So you have uh, suffered with epilepsy you know, all your life, as in you were diagnosed really early in life. So before yes. we get into anything, can you tell everybody that is uh, watching today, what exactly is epilepsy? What happens to a person? You see, epilepsy is a condition where, you know, the electrical charges from the brain are uh, sent out through the body. So people have those kind of uh, convulsions, what normally people call as fits. And then uh, there are various kinds of epilepsy that are there. And the doctors know better to explain each one of them. So it is the discharge of electrical charges from your brain to your body. And it hardly lasts for a minute or maximum one and a half minutes. Right. And uh, after that episode, one could be unconscious for some time or could recover and then be normal as anybody is. Right. Uh, so uh, when, was your, when was the age that you discovered that you are epileptic and how did you realize that you have this condition? Well, you see, from a very young age, I was not very comfortable having a hot water head bath. Mm -hmm. At the age of four or five, I realized those uncomfortable feelings. And then, you know, whenever hot water was uh, poured onto my head, I used to become stiff, clench my teeth. And then uh, I used to have a kind of a blackout mm -hmm. and faint. And then after an hour or two of sleep, get up and be up and about like any normal person. Right. And then I used to always avoid having a head bath or even going for a haircut. So that's when, uh, when I was in my maternal grandfather's house in Bengaluru, one of the doctors who had come to give him some injections, he was from the mental hospital of those days, Dr. Nayak. He said, why don't you go and consult somebody in him hands? And he gave the contact of Dr. K.S. Mani. And that's how I went about, met Dr. K.S. Mani, who is considered as the father of epilepsy in this country and uh, went through various blood tests and then uh, EEG and IQ tests and then confirmed that I had hot water epilepsy and had to be treated. And I went through almost 20 years of treatment and got completely cured. I'd like to make the statement as epilepsy is curable and I'm completely cured. And for the last almost uh, 40 years, I've had no episode of epilepsy at all. Wow. That's amazing to hear because a lot of people, I think... Uh believe that they have to live with this condition, you know, for the rest of their lives. I think that's one thing that triggers a lot of anxiety. So, uh, sir, for you, you spoke about hot water anxiety. Uh, so, sorry, hot water epilepsy. Right. Now, um, what are the other triggers that cause an epileptic uh, fit in a person? What are some things that we should know about? It can come to anybody at any time. But uh, I was born with it and cured. Cause is still not known. Anybody can get it anytime, as I said, I'm repeating. But then once somebody has this condition, it's nothing to be worried about. It's just for a few seconds that you get this kind of uh, attack and then you may go unconscious. And that's when it becomes a bit dangerous if you are in certain situations or if you're 
near a machine or if you are at great heights or various dangers can happen when you lose your senses for a few moments. Otherwise, you know, people with epilepsy are normal at other times. But as you said, there are certain severe cases in which people suffer from an attack many times a day or almost every day. That mm -hmm. makes them feel weak and lose their uh, confidence and uh, they lose uh, all that kind of uh, energies and weak. So these are people who need constant attention and a long-term treatment. As I said, there are various kinds and some of them are uh, of high intensity. And what I had was not uh, so high intensity. It was hot water epilepsy, which was cured. And there are many people who are cured. 70% of the people with epilepsy are cured with uh, medical interventions, either giving them long-term treatment or through surgeries too. Right. So you said that uh, when somebody came to visit your grandfather, uh, they suggested that you go to Nimhans to get yourself uh, checked and treated. Yes. And yes. you very aptly said, and even today a lot of people say that Nimhans is a mental hospital, which I think <laughs> is a terrible, terrible, terrible way to you know, uh, describe an institution like that. But uh, yes, there is a lot of stigma associated with it. So what, considering that you were born in the 60s when it was still, you know, calling Nimhans was, it really meant that the person had some issue with them, right? So did you face any such uh, social stigmas? And if so, yes. what were they? It was very strong in the 60s. And my own kith and kin, my cousins, all of them, when they got to know that I was visiting the Nimhans, the madhouse or the mental hospital those days, they started calling me a madcap. And uh, they were restricted from playing with me. In fact, I would uh, even be left out when the whole uh, joint family would go out on a picnic or go out shopping. And you felt you were ostracized. They used to ridicule you. And then they also used to, uh, you know, uh, keep you off from various activities. As a seven, eight-year-old, you can understand, any right. seven, eight-year-old will feel depressed when you're left out and when they ridicule you and they malign you. This is what I faced. But then thanks to nature, I was able to find a way out and then counter that. And that stigma still is around even today. Many sections of the society have the strong stigma because they haven't understood what this condition is. There are a lot of misnomers, a lot of misinformation. Mm. Even the so-called educated people do not understand what this condition is. And they think it's a mental illness. They think it is some kind of madness. And today, on a lighter wind, I keep telling people, those days, the Nimhans Hospital or Mental Hospital was outside the city. Today, it's in the center of the city because the whole city has gone mad. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting way to look at it. <laughs> so you said um, nature cured you. Please tell us more about that. Uh, well, nature did not cure me. I had oh, medicines. Nature helped, I was yeah, nature helped, nature you. helped me. Uh, I was prescribed uh, what is called as uh, eptoin, phenotoin. Uh, for about almost 20 years I had them and there's one thing about it that when you prescribe medicines you need to take it at a particular time at eight o'clock in the morning and eight in the night and for almost a year I had what was called as the phenobarbitone gardenal a strong tranquilizer mm -hmm. this is to just keep your mind calm so that you know there won't be more of electrical charges that would be released and then a possibility of an attack can be reduced right. how nature helped me is nature helped me discover myself my own innate abilities. And at eight years, I learned that, you know, if you showcase your abilities, like I was good at painting, sculpting, mimicry, and some kind of, you know, uh, stage play and all that, you could divert the attention from the people in the society who try to ridicule you or put you down. And they started appreciating some fun and, you know, uh, these kind of uh, artistic pursuits. So that's what helped me to build most of the strengths that were inborn and then follow that to even have them as an occupation and later it became a vocation and turned into a profession. So very interestingly, uh, you are a maestro of calligraphy and from yes. what I have read about epilepsy, it affects fine motor skills. Right. So tell us how did you discover this passion for penmanship and calligraphy and I see a lot of really intricate things like miniature model making and all of that. So Correct. tell us, tell us the connection and tell us if uh, that really helped you cope with your condition. See, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, epilepsy didn't affect my fine motor skills, but then it all, it's also connected with the nerves. Mm -hmm. But my basic interest in art by nature, 
hmm. led me into painting, sculpting, and then went into miniature model making. And then I finally ended up with lettering, which led me to calligraphy. And there was an also artic an article written 10 years ago, even an epileptic can do precision jobs, perfection, eye and hand coordination. You can train yourself when you have the passion to do certain things. Passion takes over and it can overcome even those uh, oppressive difficulties that you face. That's what happened to me. Speaking of difficulties that you face, is there any episode of an epileptic attack that you remember very clearly that you would like to talk about or share? That was terrifying well, or uh, it was a little unsettling for you? Well, it was once that I was, uh, I remember in a queue standing to buy a ticket for a movie called Shole. It was a famous movie those days. Right. And all of a sudden, I had a blackout and I collapsed there. And uh, I think one of my paternal grandfather had come in there and he was uh, quite panic, panic stricken and then trying to do something and then try and, uh, but I recovered after some time and then it was all normal and all right. But that was in public when I was standing in the line to buy the ticket. So that is something which I vividly recall. Otherwise, most of the other things have been only inside the bathroom when the uh, hot water was poured on the head. Even the shikakai smell could trigger the attack. These things were something which were trauma very traumatic to me. So, uh, sir, tell me, uh, we know visually through movies or you know through serials or whatever we watch, what an yes. epileptic fit looks like. Um, tell us, after your episode is over, what happens? Do you remember it? Do you not remember it? Or is it like a complete blackout? What, what is the after uh, mark of it? See, initially you are experiencing, I was experiencing uncomfortable feelings. And I would say, I don't want to have this kind of a hot water head bath. Mm -hmm. Then it would lead to clenching of the teeth. Maybe that's where the nerves were all trying to tighten up. And then I would see, I mean, it's like a blackout happening and you see stars. Literally you see stars, something silver or gold sparkling and twinkling and <laughs> you're gone. You don't know what happens after that, who shifted you out from there. And then you get up after about one or two hours of a deep sleep. And then you feel absolutely fine and all right. That's how I felt. But then you do remember what triggered that attack. And you try to avoid those kind of situations. Or avoid that kind of uh, an experience again. Right. You get an aura, as they say, you know, before the attack, you get an aura. You get a signal saying that there's something funny that's going to happen. So that signal, when you get, you are uh, able to tell, look, I'm not feeling very normal and I'm feeling uncomfortable. So you give the signals to the others around you. But if they are mm -hmm. sharp enough, they can pick it up. So for you, was it uh, like heat? Because if you're standing in a film uh, theater line, there is no hot water. So what, what was the actual uh, trigger? Was there anything else besides the water or was it heat? Well, I don't know because I was not standing in the heat. But as I said, you know, it can happen anytime, anywhere. Right. You don't know why and how right. it gets triggered off. I think right. the medical people may be able to throw more light on it. Right. And I'm only talking from my personal experiences. Right. And the experiences of others could be different. Absolutely. So, so you have led a very interesting life. I mean, being the first Indian to be able to write your own passport yes. or write your child's birth certificate. Those are some wonderful accomplishments. And I'm sure that... Your profession has also allowed you to travel quite a bit. Yes. Right. And again, people uh, who suffer from this condition yes. are usually very terrified of traveling to new places. All right. Uh, can you sort of throw some light on that? And did you ever feel anxious to you know, travel when you had to for the first time on your own? Well, Take us through that a little bit. You know, I, I'm quite a daring person. <laughs> and uh, I felt that these doctors were bringing in too many restrictions on an eight-year-old who is so energetic, wants to jump, run and do all that. And then they said, no cycling, no doing this, no dying that. So I was a rebel. I rebelled. And I said, when people said, you can't do this, I said, why can't? Why should I not? Right. And I'm not asking everybody to follow my example because I think uh, destiny made me do that. And I went to cycle, I went to motorcycle, I flew a plane, I became a, wow. the youngest marksman in Chennai, member of the rifle club. And I traveled, I wanted to travel, see the world. The only thing that I was stopped from and which was right for stopping me from doing that was swimming. Because if you get an attack inside the swimming pool, you're gone. 
But oh. everything else I tried, luck was on my side. And uh, as I say, luck favors the daring. I indulged in a lot of things, played a lot of cricket. Now, that reminds me, Tony Gregg was a epileptic. John T. Rhodes is an epileptic. Oh, there wow. are so many famous personalities with epilepsy. <laughs> and uh, I dared and went out and did a lot of things. But then others also, if they don't have a very serious condition, they shouldn't be sitting down in one corner and uh, having self-pity and saying, I can't do this, well, I can't do that. And uh, they should go out and try out and do things, at least in the younger days, when there are a lot of energies and try out a lot of things. Many people want uh, more of, you know, somebody trying to, uh, what you call, uh, take care of certain issues and all that. But then, if you are energetic and wanted to go out and do it, but be careful. I never was scared of uh, traveling or trying to fly or ride or drive. I just went out and said I wanted to do it and prove it that I am better than the normal person. That is amazing to hear, sir. Uh, but did you take any uh, preventive measures? Because I'm sure a lot of people who are possibly uh, epileptic themselves want to do these things. They really want to explore life, but there must be yes. some fear that holds them back. Yes. So how can you do it more, uh, you know, in a responsible way where you know that you're taking enough precautions? Right. So are there any things that you did? Well, I would take precautions of, I mean, having those medicines in those days at the right time. Would never try to do something where I never felt confident of doing it. It's all about self-confidence. If you feel you can do it, you can. But if there is a, a fear or an iota of doubt, better not indulge in it. So... Uh, normally, these people or people with epilepsy have somebody along with them. And when I used to travel uh, with somebody, I used to tell them, look, I have this condition. And in case, no, I, would, I used to alert everybody. In school, right. my uh, classmates from fourth up to 10th, all of them were very understanding. Most of them knew about this condition and they never ridiculed or made me feel bad. In fact, they, they were very protective. Even in 2000 and, uh, 10, or I had gone to New Zealand to meet a friend of mine, and he's my classmate. And as soon as I arrived, he was trying to be very you know, protective. I said, hey, come on, man. <laughs> Those days are all over. But still, he would try to be very protective. Uh, that's something which uh, people around you would do if they are concerned about you. And that way, there are a lot of people who have that kind of uh, concern about a person who has some kind of uh, abnormality or so. Okay. Have there been any instances when um, this condition came in the way of your craft? Have you ever had any instances where you felt like it was disturbing your craft? And if so, what did you do to cope with it? Well, uh, very good question. When I used to sit down to do miniature models or paintings or any kind of creative work for long hours, I would even forget my food and uh, be there, I mean, two days, three days continuously. That's where, you know, when the sleep is disturbed, when the sleep patterns were disturbed, there were one or two episodes. So what I learned from that is to grab enough sleep and then uh, you would be all right. So that's the only thing that I did. I had to grab enough sleep. Okay, so um, any other measures or lifestyle changes that you made, you know, that uh, helped you help the medicines work better or help you overcome the condition faster or made it easier for you to cope? Were there any well, other changes that you made? Nothing much. I led a normal life and uh, I never did any other changes except the discipline of taking medicines at the right time, wherever I was. Right. And tried to sleep uh, in the early hours and get up early. That's what I did. Nothing else. Nothing else. So this so, is a very... Uh, interesting thing that you sent me, which I want to read out, okay? Natural ability without education has more often raised a man to glory and virtue than education without natural ability. This is a yes. very, very, very interesting line that you, that, you know, uh, I've learned from you today. Thank you. Now, um, natural abilities for you were your you know, artistic side, your creative side, maybe your penmanship. Tell us how you uh, discovered this, considering uh, what kind of an experience you had with the stigma associated with uh, epilepsy and you know, how did you come to, come to discover these skills that you had? Well, uh, as I said, from my younger days, I was drawn to painting, sculpting and all that. In fact, 
this labeling on maps uh -huh. and the science projects that we did right. and you know writing on the science records you know in different styles that was right. very interesting so those were the days of the world without web so literally right. i had to walk to various uh, printing press and ask them for the samples mm. We never even had the Xerox, so we had to copy it by hand and replicate all these things. That's how it all started, to label it beautifully. And then one led to the other, and then precision, precision, precision took me to the greater heights. And that's how I got into improving my handwriting, then went into the next level called lettering, where you wrote in different styles, and the highest level called calligraphy with the spiritual dimension. So that is how it led me into all these things. And it was enjoyable. It was very enjoyable. And when people said, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do a damn. I wanted to prove a point to the world. Yes, I can do not only this, but many more things. Right. Um, so dealing, I mean, when you talk about epilepsy, now you said that we used to inform your friends or your uh, people who are traveling with you or maybe family members. Now, that is one aspect of it. Now, what if there is a, somebody who is in a professional setup Okay, and is uh, dealing with uh, epilepsy as a condition. What is some advice that you would give them? Because um, having an attack in a professional setup can really be very uh, daunting and can be traumatizing for a person. How do you cope with that? Correct. Well, it's always better to confess or tell people in advance because when you're going to have an episode, they'll be prepared how to deal with it. But unfortunately, what happens today is since most people are not aware of it, even the so-called educated people. When you tell them, they think you're seeking sympathy. But what is missing is the true meaning of empathy, which is not understood by people. I think they think they are, it is a synonym of sympathy. Right. But if they can understand the person from their shoes and what they go through, it's just that few moments that when they're going through this kind of an episode, how to help them out and the do's and don'ts if they are told then it can take care of the person. It hardly lasts for a few minutes, that's it. And then move them to a safer place. And then once they're uh, okay, they get up. Or once they rest, they're all right. Nothing to panic. Nobody's going to die. What actually becomes uh, difficult for people is the movies and the television episodes or television right. serials right. have, you know, tried to depict it as though it is a life-threatening condition and it lasts for almost 20 to 30 minutes or half an hour. That is too much of an exaggeration. And sometimes when you get an epileptic attack, sometimes they would be biting their tongue and the froth that comes out from their mouth and there would be some blood. So that could make uh, the onlookers feel very insecure or something dangerous is happening. Hmm. So there are a lot of do's and don'ts, which if the public are educated and then they know what the actual condition is, they would also be ready to take care of such kind of conditions. In fact, some people show them a shoe, uh, you know, they try to get a, a metal piece or a key. Yeah. And uh, when the person starts having the attack and by the time, uh, you know, they're trying to search for a shoe or a key, the attack episode is over. And they think because they showed the shoe or smelled the shoe or they held a, a hen piece in their hand, it stopped. These are all fallacies. And uh, they're all, you know, blind beliefs that are existing in many societies and cultures. Well, that is interesting because for most of us, the immediate do in case of somebody having an epileptic attack is to give them an iron key or an yes. iron rod or something like that. Yes. So are you telling me that that is not correct? No, that is not right. Oh, You'll have wow. to make them lie down comfortably and then don't put uh, anything in their mouth okay. and then uh, just make them lie down and then let them... I mean, let them relax. Don't put anything, no fingers, anything in their mouth. They will bite. So, you know, it's better to just make them lie down comfortably, open up the shirt. Some more air can be there for them to feel better. And then it'll all be over in 30 seconds or a minute. There are many do's and don'ts. There's a big list which we can discuss if you want in length. And I think I'll leave it to the doctors to explain that in a proper manner. Well, I would like to discuss a few of them, at least maybe uh, go through the basics because, um, you know, it is important for us to cover that because we're talking yes. to children, we're talking to parents, we're talking to teachers. Right. So can you give us some of the most important do's and don'ts when you see somebody uh, having an epileptic uh, attack? See, first of all, when they have an epileptic attack, okay, as I said, you can unbutton their shirt and then 
let them lie down comfortably let them not be standing or sitting in a place they can fall down when they have that attack so make them lie down comfortably and then let it not be near any other sharp objects or things like that put them on a in a safe place hmm. and then uh, don't try to you know uh, put in something into their mouth or things like that or uh, that's what they do or bring a shoe or bring a iron piece and all that just let them relax and they should be all right in a minute or two okay so you you said this repeatedly that people try to put something in their mouth i mean uh, what what do they try to give them water is that what they normally they try, try to, to give water or they put a spoon they do all kinds of things okay because somebody clenching their tongue right and because they, they're clenching their teeth very tightly you know you're trying to go against that uh, and then try to do something so that should be it's better to avoid uh, doing all these kinds of things See? make them lie down flat so basically just let the body do its on thing their like back that. yes okay. and uh, when i used to have it you know I, when i used to faint somebody has to hold me and then uh, i mean let me rest see that i don't fall on to any other object and hurt myself when i fall down that's what needs to be taken care of that you don't fall on to a chair or any other sharp object i think you get more injuries by falling on to something ah oh, okay or you could hit your head when you fall down right or any other uh, part of the body can be injured from a fall okay and when it, when when should you uh, take them to a doctor immediately now yeah, once they are feeling normal Mm-hmm. and then they get up and then they come back to their normal scene they will never i mean they won't feel that they had an attack also they will say okay i am fine now and they they will get up and be up and about moving around normally that's when you take them to the, uh, and you can explain what happened when you have observed and that will be helpful for the doctor to diagnose and then take them through the further treatment okay so have you also interacted with other people who have Uh, epilepsy and have you come across any cases that are little more severe that you would like to talk about yes i have come across quite a lot of people who have that and uh, it is because of the social stigma and the family trying to be over protective that you know somebody feels very low and then uh, uh, they somehow lose the confidence there are also some people who indulge in self pity where they are trying to extract some money out of people saying that i have this condition i need to buy medicines or things like that there are two three different uh, cases that i have seen there's one more person who looks very normal and hasn't had many episodes but then this person would get up get ready go about spend time with his friends come back and then do nothing even if you get him a job he doesn't want to work because he says i've got epilepsy i don't want to work you got to take care of me i've got problems so somebody has to feed me somebody has to clothe me that's another issue that is come up so there are various kinds of people how one deals with it is i think if they are given that self confidence and uh, their self discovery they should also become useful to themselves and the society right uh, tell us some uh, qualities that you know that you built within yourself that helped you build this kind of a career for yourself what are some things that when people told you that oh you you know uh, you must be crazy because you're going to nimans well i have to what was your response what was your response to this okay uh, i told them that you know one thing is you people don't know who i am and what i am i am lucky to know who i am and what i am and i will that's okay i was not interested in academics so i used to question even the schools and colleges what kind of a curriculum and what's the use of studying all these things mm. so i st- as i said now that rebelling behavior came in that rebel is still there i mean questioning everything why right. and i was known in the younger days by my cousins he is a why man very difficult to deal with him because he will ask you a why to explain it again he'll ask why <laughs> so <laughs> that brought in a lot of clarity and i became an autodidact most of the things that i have learned is self taught and uh, seeking more clarity about anything that i wanted to know and that led me to discover a lot of interesting things a very interesting things that i learned I mean, some of the very interesting are not any syllabus in any school college or university so that's what 
led me into a variety of uh, activities. The inquisitiveness to know more and why certain things happen, the reasons. Right. Now, that is where I think people should start walking in that path, which will give them greater clarity. And I've got two acronyms which I have always been uh, giving it people with see or people born with other kinds of challenges at various forums that I have uh, you know addressed various people with epilepsy that I have motivated when people called me mad I said fine you're calling me mad but then about 20 years ago I got an acronym for it I said you're right when you call me mad how do you know that I'm mad and then these persons will start looking at you what is this I call him mad and then he says you're right and then you're saying that uh, how did you know that I'm mad then they would be thinking. Then I would tell them, you know what you mean? I am a maverick who is articulate and diligent. So the lips would get zipped up. Some people would also use a misnomer saying epilepsy disability. They'll say disabled with epilepsy. So, very good. Correct. How did you know that I am a person who is dynamic, intelligent and sensationally abled? Because, you know, when you get epileptic attacks, you get some sensations and you discharge electricity, right? Right. So you're right. So these kind of answers zip them up. See, it's always, you know, many people in the society want to actually put you down. They have a condescending attitude towards people. So right. you give them these kind of answers and after that they will stop. They won't do that to anybody else. These are the things that I found not, books were not going to tell me this. It's only out of experience that you brought out such kind of things. Absolutely. I mean, um, you know, to get this kind of an uh, attitude, to get this kind of uh, response for people who are trying to put you down or trying to show you down or, you know, don't want you to be who you can be. I would imagine that you must have gone through some really, really, really uh, dark, dark or low phases, right? Yes. Do you, do you uh, remember any sort of uh, an aha moment or a turning point that said, you know what, enough is enough. I am done with this. I'm going to change the way my life is. Was there any such turning point or any incident that gave you this sort of uh, an attitude, which is amazing? You see, uh, this happened very early in life, as I told you, right? You were, not, you were left out from various, uh, you know, uh, gatherings or you were left out when people went out on a picnic. And uh, you were not uh, required by them. You were actually kept off, literally ostracized. That's when, you know, I, I felt, all oh, right, I need to show them what I am and what I could do. And every time I performed, every time I succeeded in doing that's when I would say, wow, now I think I have shown them what I am and what I can do. And that way I had a lot of war moments, a lot of war moments across the globe. And uh, I'm glad to tell you, that whenever I have had this and then achieved something, actually, I am sharing it with all the people who are going through what I'm going through. And for them, it's like watching a movie and they try to relate to the movie and say, wow, we are also going through the wow moment. Now, that's what, that's what gives me the greatest excitement in the recent times that whenever I have achieved some people telling me that they felt that they have achieved it. I think that's the greatest satisfaction. Wow. Yeah, that, that was an amazing feeling. Do you remember any one specific thing that somebody told you that really moved you? Uh, something like this, where you know, they saw what well, you accomplished. There is one person who is now, I can see him also, he's in this program from uh, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, Balamurugan. And I had gone to address uh, their uh, group also some time ago. And when I posted something, when I went to the House of Commons committee rooms to conduct certain programs in the British Parliament, he said, Professor, we all feel that we have reached the British Parliament. <laughs> you know, how they are able to connect or say that one of them, one of us has gone there. That means all, also the feel that we are, that kind of a situation gives me the greatest satisfaction. Every achievement of mine, I mean, if somebody thinks I'm boasting off too much or I'm trying to put in too many things on the social media, it's not for telling them that I'm doing this, but for the people who are affected with epilepsy or any other kind of mental challenges for them to identify and feel good and better. Give them that feel good factor. Now, if I have been doing it, they can also do it. They, maybe they can do better. Than right. Right. Absolutely. I, I think 
the more people see that you know uh, somebody who probably has a condition like themselves or any other condition that's holding them back going out and achieving these things i think the, and more than movie stars and you know these celebrities when you see somebody who's so relatable i think that really yes. helps you know that really really helps and coming to all of this um the one in one the most important aspect of a child or a person uh, who deals with epilepsy is the family and with yes with um, children definitely the parents you know i'm sure that they feel protective they feel afraid they feel like you know not letting their child go you know they may they may feel that way so what is uh, one word of advice that you would have for parents of children with epilepsy the first thing is you understand the condition but then don't become over protective i i would like to tell even my mother must be watching this even at this age she is over protective she just can't take it she just can't accept that i have grown older she still <laughs> thinks and that's uh, that young boy and then uh, she goes through the traumatic experiences what uh, she went through with me so for the younger parents today understand the condition give them the freedom with protection give them the freedom don't make a person feel that you know uh they would not be able to do certain kind of activities or uh, make them sit in one corner and try to make them like a vegetable i know quite a few families have made somebody feel that and then they have been pushed to a corner and they are made to feel like they are a vegetable they can't do this can't do that don't do this don't do that there are more of don'ts than saying do this do it this way you can do this so if they do uh, follow these things and encourage their children be protective till they are cured because there are many kinds of epilepsy uh, forms that i had told you so if it is very severe then you need protection when it is there but once they are cured give them the freedom and treat them normally don't treat them like a person who has some kind of a you know deformity or some kind of a inborn uh, challenge don't give them that feeling then they get their self confidence to go out and do things otherwise you know you are breaking their confidence levels i'd like to mention one point over here which i discovered i feel very important which is very important for everybody is self assurance mm. you see self confidence can be shattered can be broken when 100 people tell you you cannot do this then you will feel maybe they are right but you know if you say even if the whole world tells me you cannot do it something inside me tells me i can do it and i will do it and i'll show it to you i can do that that is self assurance right. i only wish a lot of people develop self assurance which is like the keel of the ship which keeps you on course in your life right self assurance leads to self confidence and a healthy self confidence will lead you to a good self esteem well that is i mean um, epilepsy issues you know any everything aside i think that is very important for people in general today yes you know in yes. general people need to really believe that they can do what they set out to do i think very important no, my, point that you my best out. form of motivating normal people is also i was seen as an underdog who became a super dog and <laughs> if you're a normal dog you can become super super dog sorry to use <laughs> the dog but then they call you as underdogs right 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 so i said an underdog to a super dog but if you're a normal dog you can become a super super dog why not yeah absolutely why not so i think that self assurance thing is important for everybody in general today you know think considering how right. much how much we are bombarded with uh, negative things you know coming coming right. our way see the Now, problem is uh, yeah. i would like to add to it if you don't mind Absolutely. the problem is as long as you're not performing or you're an underperformer according to the society in academics or whatever they think is right you know they uh, try to put you down and say useless person unwanted weight on earth and somebody introduced me once when i was to getting into this calligraphy business as he works for rkd I said what is rkd right skilling department okay so i was surprised that somebody is just going to be having food and doing nothing useful so you know these kind of things should be stopped people should stop putting you down and then they should try to see that they encourage you in what you do this is the bane of the society even today so true that is absolutely true you know i think but somewhere before we stop others from putting us down i think we should just not allow them to yes you know i think that is very important because how many people can you stop at the end of the day right how so, many people can they you stop they have to realize absolutely it is uh, i also feel don't read me wrong or anybody who's listening don't take me wrong 
people who have not understood other people who have certain conditions mm. though they may be highly qualified i feel that they suffer from intellectual poverty yes absolutely they are highly educated they have memory but they don't know how to understand and apply and that's where the intellectual poverty has created a lot of problems for the other people around yes that is that's a very interesting uh, topic is an interesting word that you used especially because you're talking about uh, maybe epilepsy and mental health there is yes. so much that is unknown about it that it is unbelievable the people who are so qualified so educated i mean these are these are something that that's why we are here talking about these things you know wonderful i appreciate that you yeah. have this program and it is reaching out to a lot of youngsters and parents yeah. and the other people in the society i'm glad you're doing this this is the need of the hour absolutely that's precisely why we you know uh, try to talk about these subjects which are i honestly we don't understand why they are taboo but uh, they are so we need to address them at some point now that said uh, do you think there are other ways that we can um, raise awareness about topics like epilepsy what what else can we do to make people more aware well i think you had a very good beginning we have made a big start now good beginning by talking about it on this uh, platform or the forum it should be extended to more forums and uh, clarified i i use this acronym you know in the past we had an acronym called abcd i don't think you would have heard it in the 80s american born confused they say <laughs> yes i find that today we have ibcds indian born confused dc who need to be taken to another ibcd which is called as indian born clarified dc today that clarity is missing amongst majority of people it's only confusion all over because they are quarter baked and half baked mm. you could reach out to a lot of people with the correct information and see to it with the right perception Right. not with some kind of a wrong blind belief that has existed over a period of time it's time to clarify i think you're doing a great job and we need to take it across to more number of people of all these sensitive issues taboo subjects and bring great clarity through people who have achieved something against these things and people who have provided some kind of solace and support those kind of people should be brought on and then it should become a very good forum to disseminate this information yes i think that is that is the goal that is really something that we are trying to do and hopefully i mean we have people like you who are coming and talking to us openly who want to really put the message across which for us is a great thing you know because yes. honestly for us to get people to talk about it is the hardest part you're right <laughs> you know there was also a saying in and the epilepsy association that you know bring them out of the shadows yes and uh, i'm reminded of benjamin franklin who said you know uh, about sundials in shade what will a sundial do if it is in shade doesn't work doesn't show you the time yes so bring people out of those shadows that they are in so that they are out in the sun and they could do something like the time is ticking away and they too could become useful to themselves and the society bring them out yes assure them give them the assurance well come out you can do this you can do that come on try it out give it a hand hmm true very true i mean if they won't talk about it who will you know i mean if i don't yes. talk about the conditions that i have who else will so that is probably one of one of the reasons also by people like yeah, you coming and talking is so important for us you know the insecurities that are created and also when you start performing the other side is the people in the society feel so jealous about your performance or if you become a bit famous or you become well known and if you performed they get insecure because yes. of your kind of popularity that you're getting i would appeal to people please leave out jealousy please remove jealousy don't feel jealous about other people that makes you insecure and it will lead to your inferiority complex True. i hope people get out of that and then you know everybody can be peaceful and everybody can appreciate each other's strengths and everybody could be uh, you know leading a life where you don't really want to put down somebody unnecessarily yeah i think there is enough for everyone to you know enjoy and experience in this huge world that we have so yeah definitely right. that is very very important now uh, 
So there are a few questions that I really want to talk about when it comes to yes. parents, children, and teachers. Yes. Uh, since this is all about you know raising awareness for them specifically. Now, right. if um, there is a there are parents who are enrolling children uh, to school, a child with epilepsy. Yes. What are some of their responsibilities? What What are some things that they must do? The parents should always tell the teachers and the school that my child has epilepsy. This is the condition. And in case they have an attack or an episode, how to, you know, take care of them. Inform the parents immediately or take this kind of uh, measures we can put them into a comfort zone. And uh, teachers also should be treating them equally in the class rather than keeping them away or, you know, trying to segregate them, which some of the teachers do because I'm not blaming teachers. We have people coming from all kinds of uh, backgrounds and uh, the way you are born, raised and uh, you are told certain things. Even some of the teachers succumb to this kind of social stigma and the blind belief. So that education of teachers must happen. Right. Teachers need to be educated about this condition. For example, you know, uh, I used to also talk about uh, dyslexia and learning difficulty mm -hmm. way back 30 years ago. And many people did not know about this condition at all. And only thanks to Thales, it woke up a lot of people. Right. So maybe you could also be doing a similar, uh, right. you know, a film like Thales Zamipa to wake up a lot of people. Right. I mean, that's the hope. <laughs> so, um, so are there any, in, in, in a classroom condition, um, you know, in a classroom setup, what are some things the teachers should know? Like you said, they need to be educated and they, they may tend to sort of leave the child out in strenuous activities or certain activities thinking that it may affect the child. So what are some things that teachers should know, especially physical activities? I would assume that uh, these children are not allowed to, or maybe a, teachers would be afraid to put them into certain activities. So what should they know? See, swimming is something which they should be allowing them to do. But then other activities like playing games and all is fine as long as the person is okay. But keep a watch on this person when they are moving around in the field or whatever it is. And let them not go more towards any kind of uh, sharp object or anything that is going to be obstructive in case they have an attack. Wish that they don't. But they, they should have an eye on this person. Right. And some people may have vertigo or great heights if they're taking them out somewhere. Mm. Avoid those kind of situations, great heights, water, great heights, fire, and all those kinds of uh, places. Keep them yeah. in a safe place, but allow them to enjoy the game. As I told you, right, John T. Rhodes and Tony Craig played good cricket. Yes, yes, absolutely. So, yes. And um, the next thing is, you said your classmates are very, you know, helpful and they were very uh, supportive of you or even protective, as you said. Yes. Now, if there are any kids that are watching, maybe younger ones, maybe the teens, what are some things that they can do to make their friend or classmate feel okay in the class? First of all, let them not ridicule them when they have a condition, right. any kind of such conditions. Second is they can be talking to them in a very supportive manner that, you know, I'm there with you, don't worry, or hold them. Now, I am very thankful. In fact, I would like to mention this. We have a group called 10D on WhatsApp. And uh, all these guys on that group, even today, are very, very supportive and a wonderful group. I mean, you, I can't think of better relationships or friendships that we built from the fourth standard onwards. We are still together. I can never forget them. So like that, if you have friends who are not jealous about you, friends who are concerned about you, I think I'm very lucky to have them. I wish the other uh, classmates of uh, those children who have this kind of condition are also supportive and give them that kind of uh, encouragement and tell the teachers also, if there's a new teacher coming in, well, uh, don't do this or do this with them or do this with this girl or a boy. He, he or she has a condition, be careful. Because what used to happen is one episode is we had a teacher who used to pinch the ears and keep on doing something. So even pinching my ears and trying to do that with my earlobe used to trigger some kind of a funny feeling. So I told one of those teachers, don't do this. And I had a attack in the class and uh, then everything went uh, haywire. I think I, I, I think in some kind of a re reaction, I bet him up. From that day onwards, teachers were very scared to come to me also. Then I said, look, 
I'm not somebody who beats you up wantedly. I said I'm feeling funny. Don't do this to me. And even my friends were telling, no, please don't do this. But then teachers were not aware those days. Right. So such, such kind of embarrassing situations also can come up. So it's better that their friends are able to give them a forewarning and tell them, please right. treat this person normally. And don't put them down when they're not scoring good marks. Don't ridicule them and say that, you know, you're fit for nothing. Now, what schools are doing or colleges are doing is testing your memory. They're not checking your understanding and application. I'm sorry. Right. Right. That is true. I mean, uh, at least uh, today there is a shift towards life skills. They're trying to, you know, give children that, uh, you know, vocational, uh, what do you call it? exposure that, you know, they can do other things besides just right. learn and write and finish exams. So I think the shift has started, you know, That's really good. hopefully that will carry on and go forward. That is the hope for schools and education. Because like you said, we don't know what children are going through and probably, you know, they do not, academics may not be their strong, strongest suit. Yes. So but again, you know, uh, academics is required to Absolutely. an extent. Absolutely. But then beyond that, you know, academics should help them discover their natural abilities True. and their innate strengths. True. Because look at most of the successful people. They have not succeeded because of their uh, university degrees, mm. but with their abilities that they brought out after that. It's either their own ability or it is a combination of both. I mean, what you read out in the beginning, what Cicero said, natural ability without education has risen a man to glory and virtue than education without natural ability. That was very well put in second century BC, I think. And it holds good even today. Yeah. And that was that statement. I really, I really enjoyed I'm glad I learned that. And it's, um... It is so important for everyone to know, parents or the teachers, even yes. the children themselves, they need to learn how to, you know, find their ability and find their strengths. Now, <clears throat> tell us, sir, uh, have you come across any myths about epilepsy that you've probably found ridiculous or you've found funny or you've found, you know, that this is the reason why people don't talk about this condition? Well, there are so many myths, like, you know, somebody thinks it's a evil spirit possessed a person when they have an epileptic episode. That is something which you find with many people and in the rural areas and then they try to drive away the ghost that has possessed you or things like that. Right. These are myths and there are myths about uh, people with epilepsy and getting married. Thanks to Dr. K.S. Mani who fought for that particular uh, point in the law where they said a person with epilepsy can be divorced after marriage, if they found that they had epilepsy because it was wow. under mental illness. And he changed it and said, it's not a mental illness, it's only a mental condition. And so I think he has saved a lot of uh, marriages. And again, a lot of people have this question whether to reveal or not to reveal. And anyway, if you reveal, you don't get married. If you don't reveal, somebody will get to know and then there are divorces. Such kind of misunderstandings have happened. So those kind of things also need uh, to be clarified and those myths can be removed. And then they think uh, people with epilepsy can't do many things. Uh, the strongest myth is that the evil that possesses you, that possesses a person. Sir, this is something I didn't know that, uh, you know, you could divorce somebody because they have epilepsy, which is, which, you know, is yes. pretty shocking. It used to be there in the Esther years, but then the law has yeah. been changed. And there are so many archaic laws that need to be changed. So that, that we didn't cover one very important uh, point is, if your spouse has um, epilepsy, how do you yes. help them or uh, does it affect a relationship? Can you talk to us about that a little bit? Because I think that is important for if parents are watching or if you know, somebody with a, yes. with a spouse. Now, as I said, no, it's better to inform them. But in right. my case, when I got married, uh, long before I got married, those episodes had stopped. So right. uh, nobody had uh, later seen me having an episode. But still, I would tell the parents to reveal the condition and tell the other family about the epileptic uh, condition. That's always better to tell the truth. No point in hiding it or holding it back. And there are also, again, a myth. If they get married, it will get all right. <laughs> they get them married and the epilepsy will go away. There's so many of them. Each culture has its own, what you call, 
blind beliefs and myths that they have built over a period of time. So, uh, so <clears throat> now that you've said that you're completely cured, you're completely cured of this condition, does it mean yes. that you will never ever have an attack again? I mean, is, it, is there some... Well, is one does not know. Till now, 40 years have gone by and I haven't had a single episode. I mean, is there a way of, is the there a way of uh, knowing? I mean, do the doctors tell you something? 40 plus that... years ago. <clears throat> do you get like a... Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Yeah, I think there's a small glitch. So, is there any way of knowing that you're 100% cured? Like, does a doctor give you like a certificate or a... Is there any way of knowing yes. that, okay, now it's I'm in cured? 1990. In 1990, I had my last uh, EEG done by Dr. K.S. Mani. Uh, the EEG report confirmed that I am totally cured. And he said, now you can stop the medicines and you can go about as a normal person. There's nothing to worry. There's nothing to be worried about. Though he said that, I was never worried about it. <laughs> did, uh, and did the medication that you, that you took... Uh, yes during those years, did they have any side effects that have lasted? Well, there are side effects even if you go and read today on the Google or ask a doctor, they will tell you. Long-term usage of these kind of medicines, I think it weakens the gums, makes the bones a little brittle. And then uh, since it's all acting upon your nerves and to calm you down, it wants to give you a lot of sleep. Uh, I have found, you know, in the recent times, uh, when I haven't had enough sleep, I fall short of words. I'm not able to recall certain things because I'm feeling sleepy. But if I've had a good sleep, that's when I find my flow of thoughts, my flow of words, they will rhyme and they will fall in place beautifully. Right. So these are certain things that I'm looking at. Okay, there are some issues with the bones. All those things are slowly creeping in. I hope more research is done by doctors on people who are... Uh, affected with epilepsy and who are crossing a certain age, 50 or 60 or 70, and how it affects them because of this long-term medication and what needs to be done. I think that kind of work needs to be uh, done in this area so that, you know, uh, people like us getting older can be helped. Not that you feel old or so, but then the uh, physical condition. Mentally, you don't feel old. It's a physical condition when you start moving, you feel some pain somewhere and then uh, you feel sleepy, you feel drowsy at times. Like Every day is not the same for me. I like to get up at uh, 4.30 or 5 in the morning. But if I've had a late night, it's very difficult. If there are two, three late nights, again, it puts me off for about two days. I need to sleep off for two full days, recharge and come back. So okay. I think uh, these are certain things that I have been facing some kind of restriction. So on those days, I don't want to take up certain assignments or do certain things hmm. when I'm feeling uh, sleepy or you know, sometimes fatigued. Right. This is something that people should uh, be aware of. There are side effects. Hmm. And uh, it's also said that because of long-term medication, it will also have an effect on the liver. So I think the doctors should be able to give more uh, details and insights about all that. Uh, so that brings me to my last question, sir. Um, yes. Is there any message? I know you've told us this before about self-assurance and all of that, but to put some it all up and uh, if there's one message that you want to you know, give out to people who are suffering from epilepsy or are dealing with it uh, currently, what would that message be? I'd like to tell them we are in very great company. Of <laughs> Socrates, of Alexander the Great, Napoleon Bonaparte, Leonardo da Vinci, Van Gogh, Beethoven. There are so many people in this world who have achieved greatness, who have had epilepsy. So we are actually in great company. So welcome to this club. And you are also maybe like Julius Caesar, or like Socrates, or like Van Gogh, or like da Vinci, or you are a bitten piece of everybody every one of them put together in you. I don't know. So feel nice about it and say that if you can visualize the invisible, we can accomplish the impossible. Go out and discover your abilities and showcase your strengths and then prove yourself to the world you're better than anybody else. And I'm reminded of a quote from, I think that was 
Albert Einstein who said, you cannot consider yourself extraordinary unless and until you are transformed an ordinary person into an extraordinary person. And this message is for all the doctors who have to convert these people who are subordinary into extraordinary people. Wonderful, sir. Thank you so much. That was a great chat. I think we also have a doctor in the house, in the chat, in our yes. participants today. And he says, uh, I think um, Dr. Shrikant Rao is here with us. Yes. Yeah, and he said that he has uh, treated a lot of people with the condition, which is, so thank you, doctor. Thank you for sharing that with us. And sir, thank you so much for coming and uh, talking with us. This uh, chat will be available for people to watch on our uh, channel called Hoopex TV, which is on YouTube. And we have a website called hoopsters.in where you can go ahead and check out all our content, which talks about different mental health issues, physical issues, or any other taboo subject that you should be uh, you know, trying to learn a little bit about. Thank you, sir. I hope you all have a wonderful day. You're most welcome and thank you for the opportunity to thank you so much. try and share these things and I'll yes. be glad even if one person who has yes. seen this program gets motivated, inspired and could do better than me. Should do better than me. <laughs> All right. So thank you for the lovely message and everybody who has joined us today. It was so great having you all and have a lovely, lovely evening. Thank you. Mm -hmm.